I, I would just say that that's probably the only question that really matters in all the world, right? In your whole lifetime. You have to make a decision on this Jesus. <clears throat> hey, for all you folks that are getting excited because we sang a hymn, just don't get all fired up about it, okay? Because that's just not going to happen too often here. That was a need. That was not a want. All right? So just don't get used to it. Once in a while, we'll throw you a bone. So make you happy. That's a good song though, right? I kind of wish we had all the lyrics in there. I don't know them, but I know they're good, dude. They're good. They're real good. <laughs> yeah. Now open your hymnal to, no, I wouldn't do that to you. Um, they're good stuff, though. If you like it, I love you. Um, anyway, I don't know any of them, so, but that was a good tune. Um, well, welcome to church. I'm glad that you guys made a, a, an awesome choice. This is a good choice. I mean, seriously, a good choice, not, not priding in this particular church, but a great choice of all the things you could do. You chose to come to God's house to worship the Lord. And so I think that's a really good choice. I think that he's going to honor that tonight. I think that if we were to ask, and I may do that later if he speaks to you, and uh, I think that he's going to if he hasn't already in some way. Um, but anyway, we, we've been kind of digging through the gospel of Luke for the last five months. Uh, just we, what we really want to do is we want to get to know who Jesus is. There's a lot of rumor out there as to who Jesus is. We could Google it, and it'll say a lot of different things, but we don't care really what, what, what Google says. I want to know what God says about himself. That's really the only thing that matters. And so what we've been doing is we've been preaching through the gospel of Luke so we can figure out who this Jesus is, what he actually taught, you know, what he did, what he's doing now, what he will do in the future. We want to know from God's word because I don't know about any other church, but I know this church, we're, we're all about building Jesus' church. He said he's going to build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We want to be part of that thing. I don't want to be part of anything else. I want to be part of that thing. And I know you guys do too. And so what we're doing is we're just lifting up Jesus. And so it says in the scriptures that you lift him up, he does all the work. You just got to lift him up and praise his name and he brings people to himself. And that's what we're doing. So we're going to spend about a year doing that. And this night is no exception. I want to ask you right now, like I always do, does, does God have your full attention? Now before you go answering that, like notice what you're doing. Do you have your Bible out? Do you have your notebook out? Do you have your pen in your hand? Did you put your phone on, uh, on off, unless you're using it for one of your little fake Bibles that you play with, okay? You can do that if you want. That's fine, but it's a, it's a good Bible. It's a good Bible, but if you're, if you're not on the Bible on the phone, just like toss that thing away. We need to give God our full attention here tonight if we're gonna make our time together fruitful. Otherwise, it's just kind of a waste. We don't wanna do that, right? There's a difference between hearing and hearing, isn't there? So, so we want to hear all that we have to say. So anyway, we're going to dig into the scriptures again. Um, <clears throat> do me a favor, even though we've been studying through Luke, just do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word. If you have your own, awesome. If you don't, there's tons of Bibles all around. And there's these blue ones here. You can grab one and put your eyes on it. Uh, while you're turning there, I just want to um, remind you about what Mike had said about these connection cards. Really, really super important. Uh, if, you, if you take a few minutes after we're done, don't... You know, don't steal God's time here. This is his time. But go ahead and fill out one of those cards and get it into, there's some boxes on the wall. You can just kind of drop it in there before you leave. We want to get this directory going because it is important. Our relationships uh, kind of really amp up our church experience, right? You walk into a joint enough times, you don't know anyone and no one says hello. It's kind of lame, right? So we want to change that. So let's get that thing going. Let's fill those things out, okay? Um, so do me a favor, grab a copy of God's Word and open it to Ephesians chapter 5. While you're turning there, I just want to say that even though we're going to be in Ephesians here for a second and in a couple other places, uh, we're not going to be a shortage of truth. We're still searching after truth so we could worship Jesus well, worship Him correctly, and be part of this thing of Jesus Christ's church being built, okay? So... Um, many of you know this, and, and, and some of you may not if you're new, but before I was in ministry, I was in the, I was in the car business, and, and um, there, was a, there was an expression that was kind of used, a, a, a term that was used, and it was uh, often used in the car business. It was O-A-D. O-A-D is something that was used in the service department more so than the sales department, and what O-A-D stands for is operating as designed. 
So when the car would come into service, if it wasn't operating right, they would repair it and get it straight and get it to the place where it was operating as the manufacturer had intended for it to operate. Okay, that's what they would do. Now, that being said, uh, there's, there, we're just like that. We're like those automobiles, is that we have a manufacturer, and he has designed us to operate in a certain way. And so what the Bible would say is that there's this longing inside of you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it would say that God has placed eternity in the hearts of all men. So there's this thing in all of us, whether we believe in him or not, there's this longing, there's this vacuum inside of us that's longing to be filled, that, that needs something bigger and above and some meaning and some significance and purpose in life. And so we're trying to jam all these things into the vacuum to find purpose, and none of them work. But there is that longing inside of everybody. And so what God has done in his grace is he has provided a way, a, 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 an owner's manual, if you will, so that you could clearly see who he is, who you are, and how you are to operate in this life that he's given you. So, so this is where we find truth. So we could find out how we could someday, someday, operate as designed. And I spent... 30 plus years in need of a massive tune-up. Big, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Don't leave me hanging up here, right? Y'all, you righteous people. Y'all needed one. Yeah, he still needs one, right? I need one too. I'm, I'm misfiring on one of my cylinders still, right? I still need some help. But, 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 but God willing, we're going to learn here how to operate as design. Now, as a preacher, my task is every single week is to dive into the scriptures um, and to lead by example. I say this because every one of you should be diving into the word of God so that you can find out how you're supposed to operate, right? So you can finally find the peace that your heart's been searching for your whole life. And so I, my job is to not only dig stuff out for you, but also to lead by example. I am doing the same thing because I, I need help. And so also, not only do I need help, but y'all need help, and I want to help you get there. So I'm going to dig through the scriptures looking for some information that I can somehow pass on to you so that you can find the help that you need, so you can operate as designed as well. My job is not to dig out stuff that's not there. I hear that a lot, right? You hear stuff that's just not, where did that even come from, right? You hear stuff all the time. And, and you're like, where did that come from? I'm not here to dig out stuff that you've never seen that's not there. I'm there to dig out stuff that's been there. The word of God says of itself that it's alive. And so it meets you in different places in your life. That means it's not really changing, but you are, your circumstances change, and you can find things that you read 100 times, and on 101, you go, wham, what was that? And so that's my task is to try to find some stuff and glean from the treasure chest of God's word that you might come here and find some semblance of hope before you leave this joint tonight. And I hope that we're able to do that. And so where God led me this week in preparation is Ephesians chapter 5, and there's a couple more, but I want to read uh, four short sections of scripture to you, if that be okay. I'm going to read them to you, okay? Now I'm going to start in Ephesians Chapter 5, starting in verse 8. We're going to do 8, 9, and 13. Are you guys there? Yes. Everybody there? Don't want to leave anyone behind. We're in this together. Okay, so it says here, uh, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. And he goes on, he starts talking with the people who aren't living in the light. And he says, but them, those people, their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. And now jump over, if you will, and we'll take time to let everyone get there. 1 John chapter 1. That's a beautiful sound. I once went to a church years and years and years ago. I won't say of its denomination or, or network or anything like that. There had to have been a thousand people in that room. And, the, and that, that man got up and, and mentioned where he was going to be reading. And I pulled out my Bible and I'm turning to it and I'm starting to read. And all of a sudden, about halfway through his reading, I look up and I'm like, ain't nobody in here with a Bible. 
And I started thinking, man, this guy could say anything. And they'd believe him. A bunch of dumb people in here, right? <laughs> I'm so glad you have your Bible. Okay, 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth, remember that. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. And you just jump to the very next chapter and read verses nine and 10. If anyone claims I'm living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. And now jump backwards to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John as this apostle, this great apostle, early apostle of the church, uh, begins to unfold to his audience that he's writing to who this Jesus Christ really is. And so at the beginning of his gospel, this four of them, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I hope that you're there, right at the beginning, first chapter, first verse, in the beginning, the word, and the word there is, is capitalized, uh, indicating a person, not just letters. Uh, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. Please don't ask me to explain that to you. He existed in the beginning with God, further confusing. God cre created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that, so that everyone might believe because his testimony. John himself was not the light, he was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is a true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now, I'm not the sharpest uh, knife in the drawer, and I'm certainly not the most observant of men. As a matter of fact, I'm sure I'm not even the most observant of, of the people just in this room. And my hearing is really not that good. And sometimes I have to wear glasses, cheaters when I read. So my senses aren't really great. So could you just kind of maybe help me out here a little bit? Yeah. What, what is it that God is kind of talking about in these verses? What's one word that just kind of went through the whole thing? Light, light right? The light, the light. Okay, so, so, so what, what is this, 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 this light that, that God's word speaks of? Well, we see uh, in all the stuff that we read, we saw that, that Jesus is the true light and that he gives light and the light shines and we live in the light and the light lives in you. Like that's further confusing. That's like the Trinity and, and he was with God and he was God. Like that's really confusing. So he, he, the light shines, we live in the light, the light is in you producing what is good, right, and true. Well, Galatians chapter 5 clearly tells us that it's the Holy Spirit that does that work inside of us, producing the fruit of the Spirit. And so, just for our conversation tonight, perhaps the Holy Spirit is the light. It's also said that the light exposes sin. We read that just now. But it also says clearly in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 that it's God's Word that does this specific job. So for the sake of our conversation about light tonight, perhaps it's the word of God that's the light. Jesus is the light. The Holy Spirit is the light. God's word is the light. We live in the light. The light lives in us, so it's kind of like this life that we live now. And then, of course, it says that God himself is light. So the question beckons, what is the totality of this light? Uh, I'm looking at you like you're looking at me. I got no idea. <laughs> I have no clue. I, I would just suggest to you that it's the totality of all that we just read. Is it, is it just God's spirit? I, I, is it God's word? Is it this light? Is it this life that we live in? Is it Jesus Christ? Is it God? Is it, what, what, what is this light? I would just say that it's all of those things. 
So God gives you this whole new life by giving you himself in the form of his son Jesus, his Holy Spirit, his Holy Word, the scriptures, and according to 1 John 1, 6, which we read, he wants us to practice this new thing. He wants us to practice this new thing. You see, because there's a massive difference between claiming that you're living this way and actually living it out, right? Big, big difference. Two totally different worlds. The person who is really living in the light is led by the Spirit, obedient to his word, and when someone would look at that person, they would see Jesus Christ, the Lord. Otherwise, if they don't, then you're someone who says at the end of days, Lord, Lord, and Jesus goes, who are you? I never knew who you were. Well, you claim to be, well, lip service. And see, see when, we, when we live in the light and we're obedient to his word and we're following his spirit, then that means we become his ambassadors. We carry his name. We have his ring signed on us. We carry his message. The scriptures say that he's making his plea through us that we are agents of reconciliation. We're little Jesuses running around here on this earth. We're actually temples of the Holy Spirit where God himself lives within us. So to summarize this whole thing, that this light thing is, is God, God is light. And God's son is light. And his spirit is light. And his spirit is light and his word is right, is light. And this life that he's given us now, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, behold a new man. That new life is light too. So you live in the light and the light lives in you. I'm totally confused, it's all of it. Does anyone have a better explanation of this thing that is so mysterious and awesome, really? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Right? That's what it is. I've written your word on my heart that I might not sin against you. At the moment of conversion, Ephesians 1.13 says that Christ gives you his Holy Spirit. It's now living inside you. All of this is inside. This is all given to you by Almighty God at the moment of conversion. Okay, so why are we talking about light? I thought we were talking about Jesus. I thought we were preaching through Luke. Well, the reason why we're talking about light is because I committed to you years and years and years ago. If you've been here a long time, you'll know I committed not to skip stuff. That the only way we're going to actually pursue truth and worship Jesus correctly is if we have the full counsel of God. If we don't miss stuff, look, there's tons of stuff in here that I don't want to preach because I don't like it. Who reads the Bible and says, I don't want to do that, right? I do all the time. <laughs> Makes me so mad. This stuff I don't understand. I can't teach this. I don't understand it. Too bad. Just tell them what it says. This stuff that scares me because I don't understand what it means and I have the weight of having to teach it to you and have to give an account to the, to the Lord someday of what I taught to you. That's, so that's a lot of pressure, right? So I don't always want to, to preach stuff, but I'm going to do it because I committed to you and I committed to the Lord that I would do that. And so if we're going to worship Jesus correctly, if we're going to build his church, then I have to, uh, to preach the whole thing if we're going to actually be fruitful here at Revolution Church. I have to kind of uh, pick up where we left off all the time, even if I don't like it. And so that's what we're going to do. So what, what, where do we leave off? Well, some of you weren't here last week. And we, we left off in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke chapter 8, uh, Jesus begins to pour out this, this illustration of, of, of a farmer, like he's spreading out seed, and there's different types of soil. And so we re, well, just a, a quick review of that, uh, I want to I wanna, I wanna just say that um, before we review it, the, the reason uh, behind the study of it last week was that this was a new year. And this is, a lot of you, most of you, this is a new church. And, and I know that no matter what church you're at, and if you chose to be in this one, you want your church to do well. You, you want your church to be effective. You want more people in your community and to the ends of the earth to know, love, and worship Jesus Christ. I know that, right? That's why we're here. We're not just phoning in. We're not just having fun. We want that to happen. And so I was sharing with you guys that I believe in my heart because of all the things that I see before me that 2017 is going to be an amazing year for Revolution Church. That more people are going to hear the gospel through this church than in any year prior. 
and that more people are going to receive the gospel and believe the gospel and be saved by the gospel and get in the tank because of the gospel, I think that's going to happen here. But here's the thing. Amen. But here's the thing. In order for that to happen, something has to happen here first. And so I was reading through the scriptures, and as always, the scriptures are perfectly worded, perfectly timely, and I'm reading this, this next section of scripture that, where we had left off just before, and I'm reading this. I'm like, I need a New Year's message, and I see it, and it talks about producing a huge harvest. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I was just telling them. And in this section, Jesus lays out the only way that a harvest is gonna happen. The only way that someday in the future you will look behind you and see filled seats and multiple services and more people coming to repentance and more being convicted of their sin and, and more giving their life to the work of the ministry and spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. If you wanna see all that, there's only one way for it to happen. It's not ca catchphrases, it's not fancy buildings, it's not the best music, it's not the best preacher, praise God. It's one thing and it's right here. And he starts talking about these soils. And he says, listen, the first soil is this, this, is this path where the seed goes on it. It's this footpath that's, that's, there's no real soil there. And so when the seed hits, it says those people, they don't even believe. Well, they, they hear the word of God, but there's no choice to believe it. There's no choice to believe it. And so therefore, there's not gonna be any harvest because they don't even get saved. They don't believe what they're taught. They hear the gospel one time, they, they don't believe what they're taught, they don't get saved, and so therefore, of course, they can't reproduce and make more disciples of themselves because they're not saved. So if they make a disciple of that, that's not a Christian. There's no harvest there, right? I hope that's not you. I hope that's not you, but the next one might be you. Maybe you're the guy of the, of the rocky soil, the girl from the rocky soil. It says that they heard the word and they received it with joy. They actually, like they picked up a Bible or someone on the street side talked to them or someone dragged them to church and they heard the preacher talking for a little bit and they believed it. it says they received it with joy and they got saved and those are the people that come into the church and they hear it, they get saved and they're like, oh, preacher, I wanna get baptized and we get baptized, everyone claps and two weeks later you're like, where's, uh, what's his name again? What happened to that guy? What happened to that lady? She was so excited. She was so enthusiastic about, but what happened? Well, the scriptures say in that section there, it says that those people, re they receive it with joy, but they don't have any roots. And so that little sproutling kind of dies. There's no consistent pursuit of the Lord. The scriptures say, as you came to Christ, so you must continue to follow him. And so there's none of that. There's no consistent study of the scripture personally. There's no consistent committed attendance in church on the weekend so that the pastor can preach God's word over you. See, faith comes from hearing the word of God. How will they know unless they are told? If you don't hear it, you can't believe it. You can't be saved by it. You won't be inspired by it. You won't move by it. Nothing. So you have to be in it consistently. And what happens is they fall away, it says, because there's no root. And things don't go as well as they thought. And they're tempted to go back into their old way of life. And their old lords, whoever you choose to obey, right, becomes your master. And so it says that they fall away. They were saved and they fall away. That breaks my heart. It happens here all the time. I wonder if that's you. I don't know. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, there's no harvest there because they fell away. The next group is the thorn people. This is where the, the seed falls into the earth. It takes root, right? That's awesome. But all these roots are all around it and they come up with the thorns on the trees around it and it kind of chokes out those plants. They never grow to their potential because it says that they're distracted. Those people are distracted by the cares and pleasures and riches of this world. It's not that they didn't believe it. It's not that they didn't receive it. It's just that they, they get busy, America. So I'm talking to you now, right? Maybe you're not the footpath, maybe you're not the rocky soil, but maybe you're the thorn soil where all these things in life get in the way. You hear the word, you embrace it. Yes, I love Jesus, but the cares and pleasures and riches of the world distract you. These things are not bad. The Bible says that all good and perfect gifts come from above and come down from the Father. So gifts are good. Riches, if it's his will, that's awesome. Pleasures, if it's, a, your, if it's his will, that's awesome. We're created to be hedonists. Do you know that? He wants us to enjoy the things that he gives us. Those are good things. He says, uh, you, what, if, what do you have that you have not received? And if you have not received it, why do you boast as if you have not received it? So God does give these things that we should care about. Should we care about our family? Yeah. Yeah. Should we care about our church? Yeah. 
Should we care about our job? Should we care about our nation? Should we care about our health? Should we care about our bank account? Should we care about these things? Yes. Is it okay to be loaded? Amen, right? Is, is it okay to be broke? Amen. Is it okay to have good things to enjoy? Amen. They're not bad, right? Those things are not bad. Unless they begin what the scriptures say, to crowd out the word. Where the word was center. Oh, I loved it. Awesome. I'm saved. I'm going to glory. Hey, man, I'm part of a new family. I love my new church. Those guys are great people. And then all of a sudden, all this other stuff starts to become an idol. And all this Jesus just gets moved out to the perimeters of your life. And he just becomes an obligatory prayer before dinner. An obligatory prayer before bed. Maybe you show up to church once every now and again. Throw a few bucks in the box. And cha-ching. And he's pushed out. He's crowded out. I wouldn't say, because the scripture doesn't say that there's no harvest there, but can we all agree that if there's a harvest, it's probably little at best. It's probably little at best. But there's good news. I'm believing for better things from this group, right? There's this, there's this one group. It's the good soil, amen? And the good soil, the, the word of God is, is preached and they receive it, and they get saved, and they, and they start digging into their Bible, and you see them, they got the tabs on their Bible, and there's highlights through it, and they're reading, and they're coming to church every week, and they're going to Bible study, and they're meeting in small groups, and they're meditating on the Word, and they're memorizing the Word, and they're studying the Word, and they're hearing preachers on the radio, and on the TV, and they're coming to church as well. They're doing all this stuff, and they're consistent, and they're committed to this thing, and they hang on. It says that those people hear the Word, and they cling to it. And those people produce patiently. That's a big word. That means we keep going, right? Parents, you understand what I'm saying? Patiently as they drive you crazy, right? Um, am I talking? I don't even know you. Right? <clears throat> <clears throat> but, but, but patiently, that means we just, we don't give up when they drive us crazy. We don't give up when, when, when there's something here I don't understand. We don't give up when there's something here I don't like. We don't give up when there's something that comes up when it's six o'clock on Saturday night and we're supposed to go fishing, right? No, no, we don't give up. We're consistent. We're committed to this thing. It says they, they patiently produce a harvest, a great, huge, say huge. huge. Now you gotta say it huge though. Huge. Yeah, a huge harvest. That's what we're looking for in our church. See, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's what we're aiming for here, okay? That's what we want to see happening for this to happen here in this church. If this church is to make an impact on the world before God can, can go crazy uh, out there, he's got to go crazy up in here first, right? And so that's the way you go crazy. You got to do something with this word of God that he's given us for you to, to, to be a part of this huge harvest. So this is a nice goal to be that, 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 that good soil guy, or that good soil gal. It's a good goal. This is the time of year we, may, we have good goals, right? These New Year's resolutions. How many in here? Like, you know what to say what it is. How many in here made some New Year's resolutions? Come on. A couple? The shy people like, I don't know. Let's see if everyone else rolls their hand up first. And then, <clears throat> right? Some of us did. About 50% of us made... New Year's resolutions. Those are good. There's nothing wrong with having some goals, right? They're usually dead by March, but whatever. You can do whatever you want, right? Um, I have a New Year's resolution. It's the same one I've had for like 15 years. I'm going to lose 20 this year. Yeah, it's not happening. How many, you know, I don't want to say how many people want to lose 20. That's bad. But, 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 but I've been wanting to lose 20 pounds for a long time and it hasn't happened and, and the sad thing is, it's just a moment of clarity here, right? Transparency in church, start right here at the pulpit. I work at a gym, and I still don't, I still won't go, okay? It's bad. It's so bad. Y'all need to do something. Yeah, don't wait till God forces me. <clears throat> some of us want to lose some weight. Some of us want to learn how to play a guitar. <clears throat> some of us want to travel. Maybe save some money, be debt free, now I'm speaking your language. Those are awesome things. Those are, those, are new, those are good New Year's resolutions. You know what a resolution is? Basically what you want to accomplish. I get that. But we don't need New Year's resolutions. We need New Year's revolutions, right? 
We need revolutions because those are sudden and momentous shifts in the status quo. They're not just a, resolu a resolution that says, this is what I want. A revolution says, this is what I want, and this is what I'm going to do to get there. That's what we need. We need a plan of action. We need a call to action to really make some change. And God's word, and you'll see here tonight, it is calling for a revolution in us. It's calling for a revolution in you personally. And we're going to see that. If we had picked it up right there in Luke chapter 8, where we left off, 816, you'd see this call to action. But do me a favor. Mark chapter 4 is the same exact story right? But it has a little bit more detail than the Luke account. And so I'm just going to use the Mark account tonight. And then we'll jump back into Luke. Okay. So Mark chapter four, don't cheat yourself. Get your Bible open. Take a look at Mark chapter four. Okay. Mark chapter four, look in verse 21. Just tell me when you're there. I was hoping for a little more time than that so I'd get a drink. Mm. Oh, now she's done. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to read this, all right? So, so look what it says here. Verse 21, then Jesus asked them, uh, would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or, a, or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where... Its light will shine, for, every, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open, and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going on. That's it, right there. Notice something here. If you have a Bible in front of you, you're going to see that there's a break in the action right there, right? Between the soils and the lamp. Okay, that's not divine. That's human effort to try to make, make a way for us to understand where stuff is. Okay, do you understand this? And we know this to be true because look, look what happens. He's, he's preaching to, these, to his disciples about these different types of soil that you might be, right? And then it says, and then Jesus asked them. So then, like, so as soon as this conversation about the seed and the paths and all that ends, it, at that point, he looks at those same people and he says, would anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. And he goes on, he talks about it, right? So he's talking about the light again, just like we had been talking about when we first started tonight. We're talking about this light, this light, this light, this light. And what is it? And so he starts to talk about light as well and what you're going to do with it. See, he's told us the different people that are out there, and, 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 and you're one of those people, and you have to determine which person you're going to be. But there's this call to action. He says, what are you going to do with this light? Remember, all four people heard the word and chose what they were going to do with it. Now, the facet of the light, we talked about the light being a lot of different things, right? It was God, it was Jesus, it was the Spirit, it was his word, it was this new life that you've been given, right? So, so the facet of light that's actually being spoken of here that's being referenced to is, is God's word. He's talking about God's word. In this, in this parable of the seed and the sower, he's talking about this word and what you're going to do with it. And only one of the four chose well. They hear it, they cling to it. That means they study it. They memorize it. They obey it. It's not a fad. It's not a season. They patiently produce a huge harvest. And to worship Jesus well, to worship him correctly, to increase his church, you must understand that what he is saying here to these people and what he's saying to you here tonight through his word is that there is a call to action on the issue of God's word. That's what's being said here. There's a call to action. Two people, two people actually believed, but there was no harvest and virtually no harvest. So you can't get off the hook. Something big needs to be done with the word of God that is made available to you for four bucks, which is made available for you for free on version on your phone. People have, have died 
to ensure that God's word would make it into your hands. And Jesus Christ the Lord, the one who's, who's author, this is the author of this book. He even said that all the scripture points to him, inspired by his spirit, right? He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the name that our faith is named after. We are his children. He is our father. And he is telling you, what are you going to do with the word that I gave you? That's what he's saying here. Would I love this. <laughs> he masterfully uses this rhetorical question. Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Can you kill those lights? So, so, so kill this too. Kill it all. <clears throat> so it's kind of dark in here, right? This is a dead giveaway here. You can still see because of these little lights and the screens and stuff like that and that blue light. But just try to use your imagination and, and if you will, if all this stuff was off and you weren't on your phone, <laughs> I love you, you, you wouldn't be able to see, right? He could see because it lights up. But if there was no lights, would you be able to see anything? It'd be pitch black in here, right? You wouldn't know where you're going. You wouldn't be, look, nobody, you can't see when it's pitch black. So it's tough to operate as designed when you're in the pitch black, right? You can't see anything. So all of a sudden, spiritually, you're in the dark and you hear the word. And all of a sudden, the roadmap of life, if you will, the declaration of who God is, who you are, how you're to interact with him. You, you've been given this information so that you can now operate as designed, Awesome. I can see now. I, I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. Thank you so much, Lord. Would you do that? No. So if this was the only light in the room, it was the only way to know where you were going so you could actually operate as design and find a future and a hope and know where you're going. Give me some destination, Lord, how to get there. I'm not crashing over tables. I could actually operate as design. If this was the only light to get there, would you do this? And that's exactly what people do with God's word. That's what most of us, including myself, most often will do. And he's saying, that why, why, who, he's saying, who would do that? Would you do that? And he's like, of course not. Of course you're not going to do that. You can bring that back on. But that's what we do all the time. We, we, we learn, we're given the gift so we could operate as we're designed to operate with some fulfillment and purpose. And then all of a sudden we just put that basket over it so that we can't see. I'm, I'm reminded as I was reading this this week, I was reminded quickly of two people that are in the scriptures. I was reminded of the Moses of old. <clears throat> I was reminded of Moses of old when he was out there in the desert and all of a sudden he heard the Lord calling him and he's like, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people. I've seen their oppression and I'm going to free them and I want you to go. <clears throat> that went well. He heard the word of the Lord, the message from God and he obeyed it and he did it and it went well. I was reminded of someone else in the scriptures and his name is Jonah. You can giggle. He heard the same voice. He heard the word of the Lord and it didn't go well because he didn't cling to it. He didn't obey and he paid the price. I teach my son as of recently that when you choose to disobey, it hurts. And we get the spanking spoon, right? Don't look at me like that. I spank my kids, <clears throat> okay? Amen. When we choose to disobey, it hurts. When we choose to obey the word of God, it brings blessing and favor and, and mercy and grace and joy, right? That's what happens. And harvest when we obey the word of the Lord. God's word, I'm telling you, requires action. 
Verse 22 also, if you look in this section of scripture, this is a, this is a stern warning from the Lord. The, the warning here in scripture, it says, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every seeker will be brought into the light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. You know what Jesus is saying here? Listen up, dude. Listen to what I'm telling you. Like, it's a big deal. I've shared some things with you. I've given you some stuff. And, and you might try to pretend that you didn't hear it. And you might try to pretend that you never, oh, I never had a Bible. No, I know. I know you did. You're in America, dude. You got Bibles. They're everywhere. They're, it's a bestseller, man. They're everywhere. And, and, and I know that you heard, and I know you know the truth, and I know that this is accessible to you, and I know you haven't done anything with it. See, the Bible says that, that I'm accountable for what I teach you, but you're accountable for what you do with that. And it says here that, there, that you might be able to fool others, but you ain't fooling him. And one day you're gonna look in the piercing eyes of Christ, and he's gonna ask you, what'd you do with my word that I gave you? People died for you. What'd you do with it, Lori? What'd you do with it, Nick? What'd you do with it, Tom? What'd you do with it, Jared? Everyone is gonna be asked, what'd you do with what I gave you? And I'm, I'm loving you right now. You might think I'm sounding like a jerk and that's too bad. I am loving you and loving you well because they're gonna, someone else that's way greater than me is gonna look you in the eye and ask you, what'd you do with his word? And where was the harvest that I wanted at Revolution Church? And we could be part of that awesome harvest if you will do something with God's word and do something well. All of us must give an account. So if revolution is to enjoy a huge harvest, then we have to be consistently and committed hearers and studiers and meditators and memorizers of God's word. And I want to give you opportunities to do just that. I'm going to read you a quote from a famous preacher, his name was Charles Spurgeon. Maybe some of you have heard of him, maybe you haven't, but his words are powerful, no less, on this exact subject of what to do with God's word. He once said, Oh, that you and I get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord, not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our innermost parts. It is idle merely to let the eyes glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historic facts, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models and what is better, still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. That's awesome. It and it's so true. He once said that he, he met a guy, he knew of a man named John Bunyan, that if you pricked John's skin, he would bleed the Bible. That's awesome. Amen. And I, I want to be one of those people. I want to speak, the, you know, the Bible, I, mean, I read this a couple weeks ago and I share with you, I'll share again. There's a, we're talking about the spiritual gifts that God's given. We need to use them to build the church. And in, I think it's in first or second Peter. I can't remember where it was. Give me grace in that. He said, if a man speaks, how many, of you, how many out here can speak? Raise your hand if you're able to speak. Okay. He says, if, you, if a man speaketh, I'll go King James. If a man speaketh, let him speak the oracles of God. That if you, open, if you have the capacity to open your mouth, let the holy word of God come out of it. That's what he wants. And that's how a harvest comes. And I want to give you opportunities to do that. What I mean by that is if I stood up here, and, and I, or, or Mike, when he's talking about the offering, and he says, listen, you know, the scriptures say we should give and be generous and all that kind of good stuff, right? Okay, great. And he says, we should give. You should give. Oh, but we don't have an offering plate. And we don't have boxes and we don't have a computer. We have, we, we, you need to be able to give, but we give you no opportunity to give. That would be kind of stupid, right? Who we, we would set you up for disaster. I remember when I was selling cars the first week, they, they get there and they think, you think they're going to train you. They go, yeah, awesome, you're hired. Can you fog a mirror? All right, you're hired, now go sell something. Death. I didn't know what I was doing. They set me up for failure. I don't want to set anybody up for failure. So because I love you, I want to help you. I want to give you opportunities to be pricked and bleed the Bible. I'm going to do something tonight that, that may 
be the stupidest thing I've ever done as far as church growth, <clears throat> but I'm going to do it because I believe in it. Here at our church, we believe in, in quality of discipleship. That doesn't mean quality of disciples. That doesn't mean that we're better disciples than anybody else. We believe in not just filling seats. We believe in filling brains and souls and hearts with the Lord and his word. That's what we want to do. The real deal. And so I want to give you the opportunity to do that. And I'm going to, I'm going to do something that, that may challenge you a great deal. And it might tick you off and it might make you uncomfortable and might be the very reason why you choose not to come here next week. And I, I make no, um, I, I, would, I would, I don't even, I've lost my words, but I wouldn't, I, I'm not gonna make any excuses or, or, or anything about what I'm about to say and that is I desire this place be packed all the time with repentant sinners. That would be awesome, right? But, but here's the thing, it might not happen next week. But I love you and I'm gonna challenge you because I want the word of God to permeate your very being. No more glancing over it and just saying, I read my section today, check mark, okay, it's time to go to work. That does nothing. I'm telling you, nothing. You have to study it. You have to meditate on it. You have to let it speak to you. You have to think about what it teaches, what it teaches you. Commit it to your heart. Commit it to your memory so that you would not sin against him, right? It, that's what you need to do with God's word. Well, we just read it and we blow through it. We don't need any of that anymore. I want to challenge you and I want to stretch you, okay? I don't want to send you out to fail, but I want to position you for victory. And so here's how I sensed God's word leading me uh, this week when it came to his word and you. <clears throat> in, uh, in my hand is a basket, I, and I have to tell you that I think I sold God short. I didn't make enough. I don't know if I have or not. But in my basket here, I've got uh, little pieces of paper, and on them is a Bible verse, okay? And what I'd like to do, Josh, would you help me? Would you do that? Couples can just get one. Can you? Perhaps. But let's, let's try to get one to everyone who is willing. But before you give it out, I, wanna, I don't want to do anything that would deceive you. I want you to know exactly what I want to do. I want you to, and this is, you probably, you'll never hear me say this again. <clears throat> I don't want you to study your Bible this week. I want you to study that verse that you put in your hand this week. I want, that, I want you to own that verse. And I want that verse to own you. I want you to study it. I want you to memorize it. I want you to meditate on it. I want that, that word that's going to be put in your hand. And, and who knows? I think God is involved in a lot of stuff that we don't give him credit. I think that the one that you put in your hand is going to be the one you need. Amen? And I, listen, I just read through. I go, that's an awesome one. That's an awesome one. That's an awesome one. But I think it's going to end up in the right hand tonight. Amen. And I want you to read that verse over and over and over and study it and get quiet with it and memorize it and meditate on it. God, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? How are you speaking to me through this verse? Maybe, maybe there's something there for you. I don't know. But I want you to read it like tenaciously dig through that thing all week. And then next week, if you want to encourage the brethren, and I think that you will, I want you to have guts because there's going to be a microphone standing right here and I'm going to call and anyone who has the guts to stand up and, and share with us with no piece of paper before your eyes to share the word that God has written upon your heart. And if so, to take a moment and share what God's word spoke to you that week and what you learned through God's word, you get up here and do that. Okay, I'm going to do one right here. Anyone else? Anyone do one? Listen, grab a, pa grab a piece of paper and, and start to tear into it. Josh, please, would you, would you hand that out? That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> I need a drink. If you're, I just want to say this, and then we're going we're gonna to take a few, a few minutes to do that. We're going to take communion together as a family, but... As he's passing this out, I just want to say this. If you're in that place right now where you feel very challenged and con confronted by me and you don't like it, I, I, want to, I don't ever want to offend or hurt anybody's feelings because of what I have done. If the gospel, if God's word offends you, that's fine. I don't care. If I've offended you, I apologize. I don't want to be a jerk, but I'm actually doing this because I love you and I want to see God help you to reach your full potential in the Lord. If you remember the soil of the one who, who, who took, it took root, right? But it, the roots weren't really deep and they faded away. 
because they didn't do what I'm asking you to do. I'm encouraging you to do this so that you will not fall away. And, and everyone who falls away, listen, I've spoke to a lot of those people in the past. The people that fall away never saw it coming. They always thought, I got saved, things are good. And then I visit them in the jail. And then I see on Facebook that they're divorced. Or I see that they're in jail or they're, they're addicts. Or they're homeless again. And you know what I'm saying? Like they, they fall again. And so I'm telling you, nobody plans on falling away. And I'm loving you well by giving you the opportunity to let God's word really speak to your heart. Okay? And so if you're on the fence as to whether you want to do this or not, can I just suggest something to you? Would you just at least take the piece of paper? Don't say no right here. You know, you ever, I get quick to make a decision sometimes, right? Start hollering right away. Because I'm a man. That's what I do. So, so and, and some of you are probably like that right now. But, but don't, don't make that decision right now. Make the decision, you know, maybe later on this evening. Sleep on it. Sleep on it. And then make the decision maybe tomorrow afternoon sometime. And if you don't want to do that, don't feel pressured that you have to come up and share. You do not have to. Just because you took one home, that doesn't mean you have to come up here and do it. I'm just offering you the opportunity to share with your brothers and sisters in Christ what God has done in your life and encourage them with the word of the Lord that's written on your heart. Amen? Amen. All right.